The 21st century New York Mets have been a club known for mismanagement off the field and underperformance on the field. Now almost 60 years since their founding, they've only been able to win two World Series rings, the same as their NL East rival Marlins have won in literally half the time. While it may not happen often, when the Mets do go all the way, they really have a way of making it feel magical. In my last video, I told you that I'm making a documentary on the Wilpons and their time running the Mets. This video is going to act as a prologue for that one, giving you a look at what the Mets can do when they're at their best before we talk about what they've done at their worst. I figured who better to help me do that than Giraffe Neck Mark, whose channel you'll be able to find at the top of the description down below. If you're a baseball fan, you'll definitely want to check out his content. A huge thank you to him for coming on. If you would like to join us and be a part of the Wilpon video yourself, stick around to the end of this video to find out how. So two World Series championships for the New York Metropolitans. The first came in 1969, the year of the so-called Amazing Mets. Most people called their season that year a miracle, and a lot of those same people believe it was the single greatest Cinderella story season ever. Founded only seven years earlier, the Mets had yet to win over 73 games in a single season. In fact, after finishing 40 and 120 in their inaugural campaign, they had lost at least 100 games five out of their first seven seasons. These were some of the worst teams ever constructed. From 1962 through 1968, the Mets were 394 and 737, which was by far the worst record in baseball. The second worst team had won 66 more games in that span. They were dead last in Team ERA and dead last in runs scored. While their 1968 season was an improvement, there still wasn't a single person on earth who expected them to win the World Series in season number 8. Former Dodger Gil Hodges had taken over as manager in that improved 68 season, and the Mets finished with only 89 losses that time, something that I'm sure got their 200 fans real pumped about the future. They headed into 1969 with most of the same guys as the year before. They were led that season offensively by outfielder Cleon Jones, who would finish the season with a 151 OPS plus and a 422 on base percentage, which was one of the highest for a single season in Mets franchise history. Their young pitching staff was headed by third-year starter Tom Seaver, who had become one of the best pitchers in baseball. Tom recently passed away at age 75. He was easily one of the most special people that ever put on a Mets uniform, and his memory will live with this franchise for the rest of time. Rest in peace, Tom. Coming off of a great year himself, Jerry Kuzman was another young star who came up to the bigs the same year Seaver did. While still a bit behind Terrific Tom, he led the 1968 team with a 145 ERA+. The 69 Mets were an instant improvement on the Mets teams to come before. They were only three games under 500 heading into June, which was a huge deal for by far the worst team in existence the past few years. After three straight wins to end May, they won eight straight to start June, including a 15-inning 1-0 win against the Dodgers at Shea Stadium. Major League Baseball was structured very differently at this point in its history. There were only two divisions per league as opposed to the three we see today, and there was no wild card or divisional rounds in the playoffs. The only opportunity you had to make the postseason was by finishing with a better record than your five divisional opponents. This was actually the first year in the history of the league that the American and National Leagues had two divisions, and thus was the first year to ever have a league championship series. The 1969 Mets had the displeasure of sitting in the same division as the Ernie Banks and Ron Santo-led Chicago Cubs, who won 92 games that year. The Mets were going to have to win 20 more games than they had ever won before in a season to win their division. It looked nearly impossible after an August 13th loss against the Houston Astros put them at a season worst 10 games behind the Cubs. With only a month and a half left of play, they were going to have to go on a streak and pull off one of the greatest divisional comebacks ever. Their next game was against San Diego, and who better to try and start such a streak than Tom Seaver, who tossed eight shutout innings at Shea to notch his 17th win of the season. It was the start of a six-game winning streak and a streak of 13 out of their next 14. This Mets team was exploding. Ten days after their loss to the Astros, they would match their highest win total for a single season after improving to 73-52, and 52, with their divisional deficit sitting at only three and a half games. With a 23-7 September record and 38 wins in their final 49 games, the 1969 Miracle Mets won 100 times and were in the postseason for the first time ever. They only won 17 fewer games in September alone than they did in the entire 1962 season. They turned a 10-game mid-August deficit into an 8-game October surplus and had their sights set on the postseason. In baseball's first ever National League Championship Series, the Mets faced the 93-win Atlanta Braves from the NL West. Their pitching staff got beat up throughout the series, but the offense picked them up big time, outscoring the Braves 27-15 in a three-game sweep. 
They went on to face the 109-win Baltimore Orioles juggernaut, a team with three future Hall of Famers and a Hall of Fame manager in Earl Weaver. Not even their Hall of Famers could save them though, as the Mets took the next four games after their Game 1 loss and won the World Series. With that series clinching moment in the final game, one of the most memorable moments in World Series history, as the fans at Shea stormed the field. It was a really good series, and as much as I'd enjoy going through it in detail, this video is more about the what and not the how. It was said that there would be a man on the moon before the Mets won the World Series. Which, which is true, I mean, beat him by a few months, but it happened. The New York Mets, only 7 years old, who had never won more than 73 games in a season and were still to this day one of the biggest laughing stocks in sports before that point, had stunned every person on earth, won 100 games, and won the World Series. That's magical. Over the next 17 years, the Mets would only make the playoffs one time, losing in Game 7 of the World Series in 1973 to the Oakland A's. In 1986 though, the Mets were poised to do it all again. And to talk about maybe the wildest team ever, I'm going to hand it over to the man himself, Giraffe Neck Mark. The 1986 Mets had to be one of the most confrontational, loud, arrogant, just like most disliked teams in history. But even still, in the hearts of Mets fans, I think it's undeniable that this is the most favorite team in the franchise's history. Even though they missed out in the playoffs in 1985, they still won 98 games that season. I mean, this team was really, really good. They had a really solid core on the offensive side of the baseball. You had Keith Hernandez at first base. You had Hall of Fame catcher Gary Carter. And of course, you had Daryl Strawberry out in the outfield, just absolutely dominating baseball. And in 1986, unlike their first World Series victory back in 69, people expected them to win it all in 1986. And that's exactly what they did. This team lived up to the expectations. I talked about how great they were on the offensive side, but also on the pitching side, they were nasty. The rotation was led by 21-year-old Dwight Doc Gooden, who was incredible his first two seasons as a Met, won the Rookie of the Year, possibly having one of the best rookie seasons of all time. He then won a Cy Young the following season, where he led the league in innings pitched, strikeouts, ERA, FIP. I mean, his ERA was 1.53. That year was disgusting. He also happened to post the highest B-War in any single season in Mets history that year, and was looking to have one of the greatest pitching careers that we were going to see. At that time, he was on pace to be one of the best ever. In December of 1985, the team made a big move. They made an eight-player trade with the Boston Red Sox, and the big acquisition in this trade, grabbing Bob Ojeda, who obviously went right into that rotation. He honestly might have even been their best starting pitcher in 1986. This was without a doubt the biggest move, the biggest improvement that they made going into the 1986 season, and it proved to be very valuable in their World Series run. In that Bob Ojeda trade, the Mets ended up sending to the Red Sox Calvin Schiraldi, who had a breakout season for them. We haven't even talked about the craziest thing with this trade yet that happened the following year, but we'll revisit that in a little bit. Unlike the 1969 Mets, this team didn't have to play catch-up. The 1969 Mets had a little bit of a comeback. The 86 Mets were just dominant from the start. They were a fantastic team. During the first two months of the season, the Mets only lost 12 games. They were off to a hot start, to say the least, and ended up having a six-game lead after those first two months in the division. That's quite the lead. As I've previously mentioned, this team was wild, lots of characters, lots of stories, and as crazy as they were on the field, they were even more nuts off the field. After dropping 3 of 4 in a mid-July series to the Houston Astros, the Mets went out to a nightclub in Houston and got into some trouble. Ron Darling and Bob Ojeda were arrested for fighting in a nightclub that night. Two of the four ended up getting charged with a felony, the team posted the bail, they were out of jail. And like, you can't imagine if that happened today, like under the Wilpon management, thank God it didn't happen then, because I don't know if they could afford to get these guys out of jail. They're a little cheap, the Wilpons. Now, the fights didn't just happen off the field, they liked to fight on the field as well. This Mets team loved to brawl. Ray Knight, player for the New York Mets, former Golden Gloves boxer, so you knew the guy knew how to fight and definitely liked to fight, was definitely getting involved in a few benches clearing brawls. Daryl Strawberry would get involved as well. I mean, this Mets team was a fighting team. They had a lot of heart. It wasn't just the on-field antics that made people call this team the bad guys. Off the field, they were kind of bad guys too. They were drinking heavy amounts of alcohol. They were fighting with each other. They got on fights in the airport, on the planes. They were doing copious amounts of drugs. I mean, any drug you could think of, the Mets were probably doing it at the time. Three of their players got the nickname The Scum Bunch because they were just kind of scummy humans. They would throw raw steaks at each other. I mean, this team did a lot of crazy things. You familiar with Lenny Dykstra? He was a part of the 1986 Mets. You probably know him more for his stuff now than as a player. Might have seen his tweet back in April where he was tweeting about how he's gone 23 months without being arrested. He was on this team and he wasn't even the biggest troublemaker. Goes to show you how wild this 86 Mets team was. And of course, you know the Mets fans were a rambunctious group. 
we caused some chaos as well. Now on September 10th, the Mets were 93 and 46. They had a 22 game lead in the division. They were looking great. They were in the clear. This team was smooth sailing. They were heading into Philadelphia, who, you know, of course, at this time, the division was a little bit bigger. So maybe they weren't a fourth place team, but they were towards the bottom. Tons of Mets fans ended up going down to this game. It's an easy drive. It's in Philly. They're going to clinch the NL East, go to the playoffs. They basically were the majority of the crowd for this game, but the Phillies were resilient. They were fighting back. Unfortunately for the Mets fans, started to get a little bit ugly. They were causing damage to the stadium because the Mets got swept. The Mets did not clinch in Philly. One of the few times the Phillies actually win something. And even then, they still didn't win. Just a few days later, the Mets would end up playing the Cubs. Dwight Gooden against Dennis Eckersley. Dwight Gooden pitches a beautiful game, and the Mets clinch the NL East title. Their first postseason berth since 1973, which of course we know they made the World Series that year. It's only the third time they've made the playoffs in their history. For the 86 season as a whole, the Mets finished with a 108 and 54 record, 21 and a half games above the Phillies who were in second place. All right, fine, I was wrong. They weren't the fourth place team that year, but they still missed the playoffs. They led the National League in runs scored, batting average, WOBA, FIP, ERA. I mean, every major category you can think of, the Mets were the best at it in 86. They may not have been the prettiest team or most well-liked by other people outside of New York, but they ended up being one of the greatest, if not the best Mets team of all time. They won the most games in franchise history. No other team has beat them. It's the best season the Mets have ever had. That year in the NLCS, they matched up against the Houston Astros, and it ended up being an amazing series. The series ended up getting two walk-offs for the Mets, Game 3 and Game 5, three one-run games, and 28 innings worth of baseball in Game 5 and 6. There was a lot of excitement in this series. The series clinching game in Houston is probably one of the craziest NLCS games of all time, where the Mets came back down 3-0 in the ninth inning to force it to go into extras, and then they ended up winning in the 16th inning. Jesse Orozco, reliever for the Mets, stranded the game-tying run at second base in the bottom of the 16th inning, and the New York Mets were headed back to the World Series for the third time in their history, third time in the playoffs. Now, to talk about the 1986 World Series, because wow, another amazing World Series. This time, they matched up against the Boston Red Sox. First two games of the series didn't go well for the Mets. The Red Sox pretty much handled it very easy, and they were down 2-0 going into Game 3, where they ended up handing the ball over to former Boston Red Sox, Bob Ojeda. He tossed seven innings of one-run baseball, basically saved the entire season, and gave the Mets the momentum that they needed to go into Game 4, not down 3-0, now instead 2-1. This series was well within reach. Mets ended up taking Game 4. Ron Darling had a great performance on the mound. Gary Carter hit a couple homers, and they tied it up at two apiece. The Mets were really starting to get hot at the right time. But then Game 5 came, and they lost Game 5 in Fenway. So the Mets were now down 3-2 going into Game 6 of the series. And we all know what happens in Game 6, but let me tell you just in case you don't remember, because wow, what a story. They go back to Queens, Shea Stadium, Game 6, the Red Sox, they win this game, they end their 68-year drought, which at the time felt like a lot, but we obviously know it continued for a few more years afterwards. But they were one win away from winning the World Series. Mets threw out Bob Ojeda for Game 6 on the mound, and the Red Sox went with Roger Clemens, who as we know is one of the best pitchers of all time. This game was complete back and forth. The Mets came back from deficits two separate times in this game, and then the 10th inning came around where Rich Aguilera, reliever for the Mets, gave up some runs in the 10th, and the Mets went down 5-3. to three. It was not looking good. The Red Sox were three outs away from winning the 1986 World Series. So guess who comes in to pitch that inning for the Boston Red Sox? Remember Calvin Schiraldi? The guy that they traded for Bob Ojeda? He stepped on the mound for the Red Sox. Everything was coming full circle. It's all starting to connect and make sense now. I told you we're going to come back to this guy later. Here it is. Chiraldi got the first two batters out easy. The Mets were down to their final out with nobody on base, down two runs. Gary Carter singled. Kevin Mitchell singled. Ray Knight singled to drive in Gary Carter, the lead trimmed to one. Bob Stanley then comes into the game. There's a one-run deficit. They got a one-run lead. They need to close it out to win the World Series. One out. That's all they need, the Red Sox. One out, and they beat the Mets. Mookie Wilson steps up to the plate. Tying run is on base. Wild pitch. Mookie Wilson completely gets out of the way. I don't know how he doesn't get hit by this ball. Like, that's incredible. The tying run scores. The Mets are tied. Winning runs now on second base. Mookie Wilson at the plate. And I think we all know what happens here. Little roller up along first, behind the bag, it gets through Buckner, here comes Knight and the Mets win it! I'm so sorry Red Sox fans, I'm so sorry. The Mets erased the deficit, they had one of the best comebacks in World Series history. It's one of the most memorable moments in World Series history, one of the greatest plays, one of the greatest comebacks ever. What's crazy is that in Game 7, Boston actually took an early three-run lead, but it was too late. Calvin Chiraldi came back into the game in the seventh inning. He gave up a leadoff home run to Ray Knight, two more runs put on the board, and Chiraldi ended up being on the losing side of Game 7 for the Mets-Red Sox World Series in 1986. Completely full circle, 
Bob Ojeda helped save the season, traded to the Mets from the Red Sox. Calvin Schiraldi helped ruin the Red Sox season, traded from the Mets to the Red Sox. You can't take away the Met from the Mets. They ended up winning the game 6-3, won the 1986 World Series. Crazy comeback, great team, great stories, great players, great characters. There's a lot to talk about this 1986 team. It was one of the most exciting baseball seasons. I wish I was alive for it, because looking back on it, it was incredible. The Red Sox had every single opportunity to win that World Series in 1986, but destiny could not be stopped. It was the Mets year, 17 years after 1969's Miracle World Series. As a Met fan who obviously was not around, who was not alive during this time, a lot of the ways that I live through this is through stories from my dad or watching clips on YouTube. And it feels like every time I get more and more information about this 1986 World Series, the more I'm amazed by it. They were down in game six, they were down in game seven. All the different stories, the different characters, all the great players that kind of only really lived and were great on the Mets. Some of these guys didn't have careers outside of it, but guys like Mookie Wilson who just became automatic legends in this franchise, that's kind of what the Mets are all about. We may not be the best team. We may not be the best franchise, but when this Mets team shows up, they put on a show. And the 1986 Mets, I don't know if there could have been a better show in baseball at the time. So yeah, a little bit different. Giraffe Neck Mark coming on Stark Raving Sports to help them out a little bit with today's video. They asked me if I wanted to be a part of this. Of course, I want to be a part of a video with the Mets. So shout out to the guys over there for asking me to do this. As always, go support their channel. And if you want to support me as well, Giraffe Neck Mark on YouTube, you know where to find me. The guys over here at SRS make really great content. So continue to support them. And that's the story of the 1986 Mets. What a season. Two World Series championships two incredible, historic, magical World Series championships. Something the Mets haven't been able to celebrate since that historic 1986 series against Boston. In the 33 seasons since, baseball's sixth most valuable team has made the playoffs only six times. Yet this fan base, this wonderful, incredible, clinically depressed fan base, comes back year after year with the kind of pessimistic optimism that can't be found anywhere else and have only recently been given a glimmer of hope for a consistently successful future. The New York Mets in the past two decades have been a mismanaged mess, held back by people who just don't deserve the power they have. All of the headaches, all of the problems, all of the professional insanity that this team has been known for over the years has stemmed from one source. I'd like you to meet the Wilpons.